following audio was originally recorded live and broadcast to the facilities of Trent Radio on November 1st, 2019. I'm Justin Evangelo. This is Disenabled, the show where we enable the disabled. Terrific to be back. Hope everybody had a spooky Halloween. Hope everybody was responsible with any substances consumed on said eve of spookiness. Today, I've got a terrific treat, if you know, you're know you of that opinion. I have my first live guest in studio today, and I'm so happy to be joined by Caleb Hunt. He's a worker at Trent University. And I don't want to get too much more into it, because as usual, they're going to introduce themselves, plug themselves. This is a great space and a great platform for him. And I'm so happy he, well, volunteered to be part of this. So, Caleb, uh, let's test this mic. All right. All right. We're live. All right. We're coming in nice and clear so far. So, first things first, as I start off most of my shows, uh, what do you do at uh, Trent University? What's your job? Title. So, um, my name is Caleb Hunt. I'm the Adaptive Technologist with Student Accessibility Services at Trent University. Special shout out to all the folks listening back in the office. I'm sure they're listening to this around the lunchroom office space right now. So, hey to everyone at SAS. So, what do I do? Uh, adaptive Technologist is kind of one of those fancy catch all words for doing a lot of technical supports for varying departments at the Student Wellness Center. So, I do primarily disability accommodations for anyone who has a technical component to their accommodation plan at Trent. So, if they're using various text to speech supports, various pieces of technology, whether it's accessing alternate formats, whether it's accessing different technology tools that help with learning. That's kind of what I do. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. Okay. So how long have you been in the field, let's say, more or less? More or less. So uh, I have actually been working at Trent University for the last 10 years. I started as a bit of a, well, as fresh graduate. And I remember sitting in my office with some of my first students saying, I'm not really entirely sure what I'm doing, but we're going to figure this out. And hey, I'm still here 10 years later, so this is uh, this has been pretty fun. Yeah, so they obviously want to keep you around because you're decent at what you do. They've over the kept last me decade, around, and right? it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. So that's I th- probably one of the most rewarding aspects of the job is just the fun we get to have on a day to day basis. We've got great colleagues, and ultimately providing support for students is the best part of it. That's awesome. So you said technical sort of components involved in the responsibility of your job. Can you? define more clearly because that seems like a not an overgeneralized statement but as a rule of thumb what constitutes a technical component in terms of you providing accommodations for somebody whether is it more sight impaired hearing impaired or is it a mixed bag depending on what accommodations are are needed that's a good question uh i mean just generally due to the nature of, of a student's disability they could be registered with our office for any number of reasons and every student's situation is unique and we provide an individualized accommodation plan so if i can give some examples there may be instances where a student who is visually impaired requires textbooks transcribed in alternate formats so whether they need an electronic copy of a textbook so that it can be used with a piece of software that allows for the computer to read back in an audio format to the student. There may be components where in large print is required and we need to do digital conversions of textbooks that may be in a smaller print or need to be enlarged. Uh, There may be training of the opposite of text-to-speech where a computer reads back to you, something like dictation software where you actually have to talk to a computer and it transcribes what you have to say. So we can thank companies like Google and companies like Apple for really pushing the envelope on that kind of stuff because we've got all these little devices in our house now that are listening to everything that we say. (laughs) And uh, for better or worse, it's actually providing a lot of access improvements for just speech recognition in general. And it's evolved a lot in the past number of years just as the prevalence has increased and adopted rates have sort of gotten better in people's homes, right? So they've been able to evolve these products very quickly. And uh, while they might have been billed as a productivity tool, or they might have been billed as something that someone can use for fun or just voice activated queries, yeah, uh, it's now becoming a product that's that's used for 
accessibility reasons, and it's awesome. That's that's great. Yeah. So from a financial aspect, then obtaining a lot of these technologies, can it get a bit expensive? Can you speak to that with their increased prevalence as the price sort of dropped, or what's the deal? Should well, I say? Well, it's with that? it's interesting because the the world of assistive <laughs> technology has always been a very niche world in the sense that oftentimes things are very highly specialized, and um, there are not those mainstream vendors like, you know, I mean, Apple's not a good way to sort of pick on things because their products are generally expensive. But if you think of specific vendors where their markets are limited, they don't have the same kind of volume of sales, uh, they can charge a premium for devices. Oftentimes, there's disadvantages there for users of specific technology where they only have a choice to use a particular vendor or a particular piece of software. They're kind of at the mercy of, you know, the vendors for what they charge for stuff. Okay, wow. I didn't expect that. <laughs> we're, we're, I think we're going there. <laughs> yeah. No, that's an, that's an interesting segue. So that's cool. Uh, branching off of that, then yeah. what challenges, they don't even have to be technological, what challenges sure. sort of come with the job, whether that be the transcription from print to a, a digital document or getting your hands on a piece of software, what challenges either daily, monthly, annually, seasonally do you face and which one of those would be the most difficult to navigate? So the we can only do so much with sort of the time that we have and there's only one of me at the institution and there's a lot of students who require support. And the nature of the academic calendar is very cyclical, right? We know when there are high points, we know startup is always really busy at the time of the year where a lot of these requests are kind of coming in for planning to have access to materials throughout the course of a year. So, you know, September and October can be really busy, but the the challenges also involve working with third-party vendors. We have a collection of digital libraries and resources available for accessing things like alternative materials for educational resources. So if we need books, there are sort of consortiums and there are libraries we can access pre-existing digital files. So that has really expedited the acquisition of these materials, which used to be produced a lot in-house, and we were limited by you know, the the actual ability to scan materials into alternate formats. And that was always a very time-consuming piece. And some of those components have been, I guess, they've just been mitigated as, as technology has allowed for more centralized storage. And I mean, there's still issues with copyright and there's still issues with access to that kind of stuff. And even going and pulling files and resources from U.S. publishers versus Canadian publishers. There's those type of limitations, which are just kind of systemic that we have to work through. And that can be that, those can be problematic, and those can be time-consuming. I, I know it's easier said than done, and it's very interesting because given the time-sensitive nature of the job, because you don't want a student falling too far behind, right. what is one sort of given piece of knowledge that all parties should know in terms of academics, so publishers, school admin, and professors and students should be aware of as you try to work your way through making materials accessible and, in essence, trying to keep them, keep keeping students on track with their peers. So the syllabus has always been one of those gold standards, right? You've got the syllabus, which outlines sort of the framework for the course. You've got readings, you've got deadlines, and helpful to have all of that kind of stuff well in advance. So if students know that there are supports that are required, having a very clear and concise access to a syllabus is going to allow for, you know, the folks who may be involved in procurement and pulling in these alternate resources, uh, the time that's required to necessarily pull it all together. I think when you when you look at those and you look at the nature of the time that it takes to actually get stuff set up, I mean, it's it's important to have that very well defined because there's only so much time in the uh, so much time in the year, right, to get stuff to you. For sure. Okay. Interesting perspective. So keeping on with the difficulties, I, I promise I'll get more optimistic as the program progresses here. But keeping with difficulties, what is the most difficult, let's say, piece of material or software or any sort of accommodable piece of material to get your hands on in terms of so I'll tell you, like t taking a long time to, to do so, you know what I mean? Whether it be a book or because of publishing rights or anything. Right. Like and because of the nature of, let's say, a visual impairment, one of the things that has always been historically really problematic is access to STEM materials. So whether it's mathematics, whether it's engineering materials, anything that's visual that needs to be represented in, in a way that's not visual, that can involve creation of tactile objects that can sort of display 
similar meaning while still not necessarily being an image. And there's a lot of barriers that still exist trying to create accessible materials that can also be adapted from someone who maybe uses a screen reader to also someone who maybe has just a general print disability who needs to have a math equation read out loud to them. Those are, those are things that um, there's been a lot of advancements and a lot of improvement on, but how it even integrates into things like the learning management system, where it can be provided in an accessible format or an accessible way for a student to interact with without the need for even going through a third party to get access to things, those are still really challenging and they're really hard to, they're really hard sometimes to get access to without a lot of additional support and resource to get that up and running. So in the event that someone doesn't have a lot of time because they're, let's just say they're a freshman, like what's the what's the key aspect in terms of getting these that's the most difficult is it the time is it the funding is it the well it's it's standards it's it's development of resources when publishers are creating textbooks oftentimes they're not being created with accessibility sort of in mind from scratch so it's either remediation that has to be done on the back end to make it accessible or in some case it's reauthoring uh, or in some case it's getting a third party involved to actually add you know tactile stuff to to a textbook to make it accessible in that regard okay so have you ever faced a situation where you had to step in and advocate on behalf of a student either through telling not a publisher, but some sort of company that we need this now, have to sort of take off your subtlety yeah. hat and and say, hey, enough screwing around. Well, it's funny because every now and again, I'll, I'll make a request to a publisher and I'll say, you know, we're we're supporting a student who has a print disability. I've validated, you know, that they've got a textbook. It's been adopted for use. They have it. Can you provide us with an accessible file that we can pass on to the student? And they say, well, we don't have a copy of the accessible file, but we give you our permission that we can, you know, you can go ahead and scan the book. And I say, well, thank you very much, but I don't actually need the permission under copyright. I can, I can just scan this book and I'm acting on behalf of the student to do so. So there are moments where it's, it's almost like an education piece where you want to very kindly and in good words say, you know, we can, we can provide access, whether it's sort of the easy way or the hard mm -hmm. way. Can you help us with the easy way? Okay. And, uh, you know, in terms of even what it looks like for advocating for a student, I'm sort of one of one of the folks who are part of the office and our, our advisors who work directly with the students as well, too. They're usually the ones who are the kind of the go-between the faculty and the student, and whether it's a TA that has to get involved, there's ways in which they provide um, some additional support where maybe a student might not be comfortable in approaching a faculty member with a particular concern that they might have a, around an accommodation issue. So, you know, I don't generally get involved in sort of throwing down law or throwing right. down, you know, the, the issue that way. But it's, uh, you know, there, there's been times where I'm like, ah, yeah, we're going to have to step up and be a little bit more forceful in a response just to make sure that access is there. So circling back to, say, the publishers, yeah. and you're talking about copyright and basically telling them we don't need you. It's just going to be a hell of a lot harder for us to <laughs> obtain the material yep. if we don't use you. Does that wake them up nine times out of ten? What's the response it's hard usually? It's such a small entity, right? I mean, generally when they come down and they say something, there's not too much we can do and ultimately in terms of just timelines and processing things quickly, it's... Uh it's easier to it's easier to just kind of take matters into our own, own hands and do things ourselves. So whether you would kindly send them a politely worded like you know thank you we don't need this we don't actually we don't actually need your help we can yeah. we can do this ourselves we'll usually go down that road just for just to expedite things right okay do they usually respond or after they get that message do they sort of cut the line loose and yeah, say, yeah, there's, well, very, there's yeah. very little response. Actually. Okay. So they, they like just... there's publishers. I, I see requests come through and my immediate response to a student is just like, Hey, I know I'm not going to get this. Can you just bring me the book? I'm going to take care of this. Myself. Yeah. Just yeah. to scan it in. And to that point, there are plans B and C if, yeah, if for sure. need be right. Yep. Okay. Then the other half of that equation was getting a student to talk to an administrator or a professor in, in terms of talking about accommodations. So, I know you don't get involved in throwing down and things like that. You're you're more of the tech dude, which I can appreciate right. and respect. But in your experience, what major problems has caused a situation like that to occur? What I mean by that is, is the professor saying, no, you can't have such and such accommodations or no, you can't have, say, extensions even when the student doesn't have access to the material they need. I think sometimes it just comes down to a bit of a misunderstanding where a student 
a student may not necessarily understand how an accommodation should be used or accessed, or a professor is just misinterpreting what the structure or the student's responsibility is in accessing or advocating for themselves in, in, in a certain way. So I'm trying to think of a good example, and maybe I can circle back to that. We're there as much as an advocate for the student. We're also there to be an advocate for the faculty and providing them assistance with what the accommodation process looks like. And I mean, just with the nature of sort of faculty and in, in higher ed, there's a lot of changeover. There's a lot of contract faculty that come in. And sometimes the onboarding process is where they might be made aware of things like, you know, policies around accommodation or around, you know, what's, uh, what SAS actually does to help support the faculty in addition to the student. Some of that stuff might get lost. And I mean, most faculty members have the student's best interest in mind and they want the student to succeed and they just need some support in providing them, you know, what, do, what does accommodation actually look like? So we continually review how we interact with the message that we put out there in terms of providing support uh, to make sure that the faculty understand we're very much allies for them as well. For sure. You want to tell them where you're coming from and exactly. what your yeah. purpose is. And I talk a lot on the show with previous guests about ignorance and how mm. that from both sides of the equation, but more so with professors and school administrators not understanding how or what exactly is involved in physical disability accommodations, mm. where they're coming from. Last week, I talked about some professors seeing accommodations as giving the student with the disability an unfair advantage. Well, if they have yeah. more time or if they have this access to this, then they'll be able to write better than a fully bodied student who's able to sit down and, and do things quote unquote normally. Right. And you have to explain to them both student and advocate if need be that that's not the case at all, right? And every accommodation that's put in place for a student is based on need, right? It's not something that's fabricated. It's not something that's just kind of made up or something that uh, we're, we're putting in place because we think it might be nice for a student to have. It's a need and it's been validated and verified. And that's it's something that's subject to review too. If it's one of those things that if a need is not being met, that's where an accommodation review comes in. And the accommodation plan can be very fluid in the sense that it might change over time. For and sure. that can be adapted. For sure. And there's two sides of the coin for that, because if a student with a physical disability is taking advantage of an accommodation and bending it, isn't that subject to review as well? Like, let's just take an example of extensions. If a student, if a professor or any other school administrator knowingly has the knowledge that the student is, let's just say, taking advantage more so than usual, and they've shown that they are capable of producing great work in a timeline-driven right. environment, and the student three four times says, oh, can I have an extension? And the extension, oh, can I have another two weeks on that? Right. that that's obviously subject right. to review as well, yeah, right? And, you know, the extensions are interesting because that's one of the comments that we often get as feedback from faculty is, you know, the student comes up right at the last minute and asks yeah. for an extension, <laughs> and they've done it multiple times. And, uh, you know, what do, what do I do? How do I respond to this? And there's been instances where the students have been advised when they're actually making a request for an extension, A, it needs to be done in a timely manner, but providing yeah. the professor with like, here's here's a rough guide of what I've actually done so far to yeah. know that I'm not just trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Yeah. I have been working on it, but for, you know, extending and waiting circumstances, this is the nature of why I'm requesting this. And in that case, most professors are okay with things, right? Yeah, and my, that's been my experience in a, in a pro, too. In an appropriate way. An appropriate way, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. If you and can, I mean, there are, there are sometimes there are things that you just can't control. Like sometimes technology fails, and sometimes there's mm -hmm. issues where you can't access things, and you don't realize it until it's time to submit a paper, <laughs> right? Uh, so that that's one of those things where you know <clears throat> profs do have your best interest in mind when there are barriers, whether they're known ahead of time or not. Sometimes the, the profs are there to help. Uh, them for sure, and they're much more willing to accept if you can, let's just say, provide something tangible and explain right. what what happened, right? As for Sure. opposed to just the, coming to them on the deadline instead of three days before and saying, hey, can I have an extension on this? Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, but it, again, it's a case-by-case -case basis depending on the accommodation as well. For sure. Segwaying beautifully then, what's most rewarding when everything comes together? Mm. What's most rewarding about your job from an academic standpoint? Would it be the success of the student? Would it be to not you know, plug yourself here, but it's, right. it's like, wow, I just... Can't, I can't believe I got my hands on a certain piece of tech or a certain text that was so rare and actually got you know got it to the student. I'll tell you one of my favorite times of the year to be involved with is convocation because 
You get to witness sort of all of the blood, sweat, and the tears that has gone into <laughs> a four or five or six or seven or however long it takes to actually get a degree. And to be there with students when they're sort of walking across the stage or to just be by proxy and whether it's a smile or a wave or a nod, just to say an acknowledgement to say like congratulations, like that's the best times of the year. There's just a great energy on campus. Everyone's happy. And when you when you see that sort of culmination of all the work kind of put in, it's uh, it's pretty cool. And while we're talking about an academic standpoint, Mm. to academics and emotion, they have a sort of a stereotype where they don't really mix, right? There's that stereotype, but isn't there an emotional connectivity? Say you've been working with a student for four or five years and they're just getting their Mm. undergraduate or their master's or hell, even their doctorate, and they're walking across the stage. Is there sort of an emotional connectivity like, hey, thanks for helping me here. We made it. Yeah, there there is. Be sort of generally, but I mean, I've... uh, I was fortunate enough to write a, a reference letter for a student who was applying for a fairly significant grant that they actually were successful in getting and allowed them to continue their their studies through their master's, through their doctorate. And they reached out and they said, actually, I got this. I got this scholarship grant. It was a, it was a real like, oh, man, that, was, that feels good. Like, it feels good to be <laughs> yeah. a part of that. It feels good that, yes, we've had this connection on the, the academic side of things, but to be able to also contribute to how that kind of transitions into the professional world as well is pretty, yeah, it feels pretty good. Especially, pretty like, have you ever had the chance to catch up with a student who actually had success oh, in, yeah. in school like they made it right yeah, and then right. and then you touch base with them and say hey where are you at and you find out they got either a decent job or they're doing really well in the profession that they chose to pursue i i do get emails every now and again almost kind of like check-ins like hey i just wanted to let you know that you know i'm off in the workforce and i'm doing this and you know, remember that tool or whatever you showed me <laughs> yeah that was super helpful yeah well it's a bit of a lifesaver in my career as well too and that's that's also very much a part of what we do is making sure that yes you have tools to succeed you know while you're at school in your academics but it's also sort of equipping you with the skills and the resources that as you transition out whether it's graduate studies or whether it's off into the workforce that you have the tools to be independent for sure and when you can apply something that you've learned from post-secondary education, because it gets a bad rap for being purely theoretical, when you right. can actually use a tool, a method, or any sort of, not a coping strategy per se, but a means of helping yourself and your you as a professional working at the university are able to transfer that to the student for real life application. That's just terrific in my yeah. opinion, because it's something they can use for the rest of their life, right. arguably. Okay, we're running a little bit tight for time, so last question. Yeah. Are there any last remarks or comments in terms of the actions academic personnel can take in order to give students who work with physical disabilities and accommodations the greatest chance of success? And it can be towards professors, students, or publishers. In in, in all respects, but I have it written down here, professors, I don't know why. That's pretty limited. Do you have any sort of... What can you tell professors? Last remarks. We're here to help. We're here to support. We have the students' best interests in mind. And I I know that from an academics perspective, the professors really do as well, too. But asking questions is really helpful. We're, We're here to provide the support, and we really do want to help everyone succeed. I would encourage faculty, I would encourage staff members to sort of make themselves aware of accessibility-related resources when there are events that are happening, to attend such events when there are are training opportunities on how to create accessible Word documents. You know, check those out. Look at some of the resources that are available and that have been created because those things do go a long way and they do have an impact on the students that you're supporting. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Caleb Hunt, everybody. Thank you very much. A doctor technologist. Great to talk to you. And I hope everybody took something away from this discussion thank you so much everybody for listening we'll be back at it again next week with another advocate if all goes according to plan from the student accessibility from trent university have a great one and i will hear from you and you'll hear from me next week